you know, the second thing is, is this is what God has planned for you. He's planned it for you. So even though we say that, God, I don't think that that's possible. God is saying that not only is it possible, but I, I paved the way. Like, I am telling you that if you do it my way, that's how, that's how this all ends. And you look at some of the holiest people and they were not perfect. Right? When you look at this Bible, a lot of the people that God used to do amazing things were people with spotted pasts, people who made mistakes. But when they got on path with God, God was able to, to do amazing things, right? And they ended righteous and holy because we were wired to be spiritual. You know, and it's crazy because I say that if you look at society, society says, no, 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 no spirituality, right? Or that's what they at least want to tell us. But when you look at actual what society is doing, spirituality is everywhere around us, even though society wants to deny it. I think it's hilarious that one of the most common signs out there that you see everywhere are crosses, right? Even by people, by no means, by any means, are they professing Christians, right? But they become very, very trendy. They're worn for fashion statements. And I believe that it's a desire to be spiritual, even if it's misguided. See, and the Holy Spirit inside of us wrestles with us, and it tries to bring us this point home, right? And the fact that we just celebrated Pentecost last weekend, it's a reminder to every single one of us that not only is the Holy Spirit there, not only is the Holy Spirit inside of us, but it's a reminder that the Holy Spirit should be alive and well. So the question is, is do you feel the struggle of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you feel the direction of the Holy Spirit guiding you in your life? Because I'm going to tell you, you either have an active Holy Spirit, and it's a Holy Spirit that's like speaking to you, guiding you, correcting you, convicting you. That's one side of it, right? And the other side of it is you have a suppressed Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit, it's trying, but you basically told the Spirit, uh-uh, not here, not now. I don't want to hear it. And I'm going to tell you, if you're in the second camp, that's a very scary place to be. It's a very scary place to be because, you know, when God works in your heart, when God's directing you and guiding you and convicting you, that is exactly where you need to be because that is where growth happens. That is where growth happens. It's like a muscle that the more we listen and the more that we obey, the stronger that it gets. <clears throat> and that's when God will start being really big in your life. And I do believe that society, we see it all away, all, everywhere around us, that they have this desire to be spiritual, right? And it's a desire to be spiritual, but it's a desire to do it without Christ at all. And it's people who want to be spiritually uh, spiritual, but they don't want to follow any religious group. And, and in, in my honest opinion, I believe it's because that they don't want to follow any rules, right? Like, I want to be spiritual, but don't tell me what's right and wrong. Don't tell me what I can and cannot do. I want to do whatever I want to do. Um, I remember this is kind of dating myself, but, you know, Christine and I, have been, we, we're coming up on about 15 years. And I remember when we first got married, her favorite show was The Newlyweds. Do you guys remember that show? Who was in it? <laughs> yeah, okay, we <laughs> watched it. But so you remember uh, Jessica Simpson when she first got married to, what was his name, Nick, Nick Lachey? Um, and it was kind of like their first couple years of marriage. And, and I remember Christina just loved this show because when Jessica Simpson came out, her earlier platform was all about being, she was very, very wholesome, right? She was, she waited until she was married. Um, her dad was a preacher and I remember they it had like this whole wholesome effect to it. But as time went on, um, life hit, her life got hard and she abandoned a lot of those principles. Um, and now actually if you, you know, so she since got divorced and, you know, she kind of separated herself from the church a little bit. And then in a, in a recent interview, she was asked about that. And now she says, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Okay. Because you see God for her was great until the way that God told her to live affected the way that she wanted to live. Because at that point, it's just like, well, hey, like I want to be spiritual, but I don't want all of those rules and those confines of what the Bible teaches. And 
And, and it's becoming more and more popular that people want to be spiritual but not religious. 72% of the generation between the ages of 18 and 29 claim, 72% claim that they are spiritual but not religious. And it's scary because I wonder, what are our youth thinking right now? You know, what are their goals right now? And I believe that this is the whole reason that this exists is because inside of us, we are wired to be uh, spiritual beings. We're wired that way. There's a desire that we can't abandon, but we also don't want to ad adhere to God's rules. So what's happened is we've developed this way where we can be spiritual in our own definition without all the restrictions. Because I don't want to do what Christ tells me to do. Because I want to be spiritual, but I want it to be all about me. And I'm sorry, but God's goal and his purpose is not to give us everything that we want. That's not it. It's to build our character. You can imagine that God's desire for every single one of us, for us to be men and women of integrity, to live according to his principle, to be a light on a hill, a lamp on a, uh, a lampstand. That's God's plan for us, right? God's plan for us is not for us to, to indulge in all of the things that we want to indulge in, although we're pretty good at that. His plan is for us to be more like him. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, we may have totally screwed that up in our life, right? And I'll be honest with you, all of the times that you've indulged in all of the things that you've wanted to indulge in, how has that worked for you? I think a lot of the times in my own life where I find myself indulging in areas where I probably shouldn't be indulging with, it's been to my own, you know, destruction. And I was thinking about, you know, one of the reasons, right? One of the guiding principles about why God gave us the Holy Spirit, it's to guide us. It's we need to lean into what he wants. When he tells us, hey, Pete, I need you to move in this area, or hey, Pete, you need to stop doing this, or hey, Pete, I need you to show love over here. You know, that is his biggest plan. That's where we find purpose. Because I promise you guys that the Holy Spirit has amazing things planned for us. It's been around forever, and the Holy Spirit is dying to disciple us in a personal way. Because here's the, the thing is, if we decide that, you know, I want to be a disciple of the Holy Spirit, I want to listen and I want to learn and I want to be more and more like he's calling me to be, then the first thing we have to understand is that a disciple is a follower of the doctrine of the teacher, right? There is no way that we can adhere to the Holy Spirit until we adapt the thought process that we find in the Bible unless we adapt the fact that everything, the school of thought, everything, that we're going to fully bring ourselves into submission of that. Because here's the question. How many disciples did Christ have? The original group, how many? I hear 12, but I'll challenge you, and I'll say he had 11. Judas was not a disciple. He might have been a disciple by name, but did he follow the thought process of the teacher? Did he follow the teachings of the teacher? No. I say in that original group, there was 11, right? Because Jude, Judas had his own school of thought. He did not buy into Christ's, right? Because what did Judas love? He loved money, right? The gospel shares that with us. He loved money. Did Christ ever care about money? No. Wasn't a big thing for him. He liked power, right? Judas loved this idea of power. Was Christ all about power? No. No, Christ was all about serving. And he says, be the least. You know, be the least. And I wonder, before we can be Christ's disciple that's being mentored and taught by the Holy Spirit, we have to buy into his school of thought. That's the only way it'll ever work. And I wonder how many of us show up here. And although we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, right? And the Holy Spirit, we, you know, it was given to us at baptism and chrismation. But I wonder how many of us show up here week after week after week, but we say that I'm not about that school of thought. Like, I'm not about what you tell me is important, right? Because I have this whole other set of rules and guiding principles in my life, and that's what I'm going to pursue. Because God's biggest desire is not for us to be extremely wealthy, knowledgeable, you know, successful, any of these other things. God's biggest desire for every single one of us is to have a heart that looks like his. And I wonder if we even care for that. 
not the petty things that we pray about, right? We pray for blessing and safety and all of this other stuff, but I'm sure that like God's listening to these prayers and he's saying, yeah, all of that stuff's great, but you know, there's, there should be more front burner issues in your life. There's a sanctification process that should be happening here, but do you even care? Because the clearest place where we see God in our lives are also the hardest. Because I will tell you, and, and, and this is, I want you guys to think about this, right? When life gets hard, when we get uncomfortable, how do we react? How do we react? Will we follow his way? Or is that the time in our life where we basically abandon his way? We say, you know, I'm going to try doing this my way. And I have to admit, a lot of times for me, it's hard because when I start going into hardship, I start thinking, how do I get out of this? I don't want to do this anymore. What's the quickest way to get through this? Even if I have to cut corners, even if I have to do it my own way, even if I have to abandon, you know, biblical principle just to kind of get through this because I, I don't care about the lesson right now. I just want it to be over. And we need to give up control and let Christ be in control. Let him live in us and let us just buy into his way because that is how the Holy Spirit will disciple us. And how does this happen? And I'm going to ask you guys that one of the things, the first things that we really need to hand over and let the Holy Spirit be really active in is our decision making, right? In our decision making, we need, to, we need to start seeking Christ in more of our decisions. So many times when we have a decision at hand, we're quick to what? We're quick to overanalyze it, to spend a lot of time sitting there thinking about all of the different possible sol solutions. You know, personally, I'll phone a friend. And I'll talk it out a bunch of different times with a, a bunch of different people. But I wonder, a lot of these decisions, do we go to Christ for it? Do we include Christ in our decision-making process? And I know that sometimes that's hard. Because when I call a buddy, the buddy will give me audible advice. But when I sit with God, a lot of the times, if I'm not good at it yet, and I am not in tune with the Holy Spirit, then it just feels like there's no answer. But I'm going to tell you that the Holy Spirit is inside of us. We just have to make room for him. And I believe that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works inside of us more than we give him credit for. You know, we ignore him a lot of the times because we don't like what he has to say. A lot of the times what he's actually telling us may even sound crazy. There's a lot of times in my life where I'll tell Christina, I said, hey, I think the Holy Spirit told me this, you know, or he was guiding me this when I was, you know, praying about this or that. And she's like, well, how do you know it's the Holy Spirit? And I said, because he, he told me to do something that I didn't, I really didn't want to do. And that's not for me. Lines up according to scripture. So it sounds like what the Bible would tell me to do. And even though I really don't want to do it, I feel that he's telling me to do it. So I know I have to do it. See, and, and I believe that, especially when it comes to trusting in the Holy Spirit, that this is one of those biblical truths where, you know, I believe that when we trust in him and we follow him to the best of our ability, even if we believe that we're following in him, and we might even be a little bit wrong, I believe that God will honor that, and the Holy Spirit will release his power after we walk in faith. You know, one of my favorite stories of this is when Joshua was crossing the Jordan River. And God basically tells them, hey, you know what? You need to cross the Jordan River. And it says that when they got into the river, like feet in the water is when the water started, you know, stopping like a ways down, right? Like the miracle didn't happen until they walked in faith and they did what God told them to do, even though it seemed like it could have been impossible, right? But it was after they stuck their feet in the water, and then after they did what they needed to do, God was faithful. And God showed up because that is the type of God that we have, that he is, he's always faithful and he does not leave us hanging. And I believe that obedience, especially obedience to the Holy Spirit, obedience unlocks the power of God. And God waits for us because he knows that my words are cheap. And I wonder if it's just my words or if you had to think about it yourself. Think about all of the things that we've promised God. God, if you show up here, I'm going to show up there. God, if you come in here, I'm going to do that. Or God, this is going to be the last time. Or God, I promise that I'm going to start doing this. And God looks at us and he says, you know what? Your words are cheap. It's lip service. There's no benefit to it. But I promise you, once you start walking, I will be there. And I get it. The Holy Spirit tells us things that could be terrifying. 
terrifying for us at times, stuff that doesn't make sense, stuff you know, that we think that this can't happen. It could be because it's a daunting task. It could be because of past fears, even past failures. Other times you've tried to do it and you've fallen flat on your face. But I'm going to tell you that God says to move forward anyways. If the Spirit is guiding you to move forward, then I'm going to challenge you to move forward. Put your feet in the water and you will see that God will make a way. And then I just started thinking about something different, right? And I started thinking about the fact that The earlier in life we make this decision, the better, right? The earlier in life we make the decision, it's better. Because I will tell you that the the longer you wait, the harder it gets. You know, I remember this back, this was a true principle back in high school, back in college. In college, people would be like, hey, you know, like you gotta make good decisions. And people would be like, oh, just with school and with studying, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. Now, being 40 years old now, I realize that the later it is, the harder it is, right? We don't get, we don't end up having more spare time. We end up getting busier, right? All of the the baggage that we acquire along the way before we make that decision makes it a harder and harder decision. There are, the longer you wait, there are more excuses not to do hard things, But there's this God who gives us complete and utter free will. There's this God who will allow us to live however we want to live. Because God gives us the power to make choices, but our choices have the power to make us. And that's a very convicting statement if you're making bad choices. Solomon, the wisest guy ever, said in Ecclesiastes 12, remember the creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come before the difficult days come. So even Solomon's saying, guys, it's going to be tough. There's going to be hard days, right? But I'm going to challenge you to make the decision early, early. You know, I was thinking about in the Old Testament, there's two Bible characters that this just stands out super strong for me, right? The first one was Job, and the second one was Joseph, right? Because when they were on top of the world and everything was going right for them, they had made a decision about who God was in their life when everything was good. And then when Job had his wealth, land, you know, cattle, more kids than me, you know, when he had all of these things, he decided that, you know what, God is a good God and I will pledge all my days to him, right? Joseph, when he was still living at home in his father's house, right, when he was the spoiled brat who got the special coat, who was elevated over his siblings, he decided back in those days that, you know what, God is faithful, and he is the God for me. They made that decision earlier in life so that when when the hard days came, they were rooted. And I love it because in Job 1.6, it says, Now there came a day. Now there came a day. And that day in Job's life cost him everything. That was the day where he lost his kids, his wealth, his livestock, everything that you can even think of, right? Right? For Joseph, there came a day, wasn't there? For Joseph, that day for him was the day that his brothers turned on him and threw him in a pit. There came a day. And I'm going to tell you, every single one of us in our life, there will be a day. There will be a day, and it's going to be hard. It's going to be something that we don't want to go through. I guarantee you, every single one of us are going to be faced with that day. And the question is, is how are we going to respond to it, right? Right? When your world's, world is falling apart, where, when your faith is being tested, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? And the scary part is, is here, we're not, like, we're not youth anymore, right? This isn't like a high school or a college talk, right? It's we've got a lot more going on in our lives than whether we're going to wear skinny jeans or, or relaxed jeans or dad jeans or whatever. Like decisions at this age are very, very different. Decisions at this age doesn't affect our lives. It affects our lives, our spouses' wives, our kids' lives, and potentially generations to follow. But there will be a day when you're going to be put in a position where you have to make that decision. And the decision is going to impact and it's going to forever change your life. You know, being older now, I see a lot of people exiting this world. Okay, and you start seeing what it looks like for different people and the different choices that they made. 
And I wonder, you know, there will be a day when, will there be a day when you realizing disconnecting from your spouse and your kids um, will leave you old and alone? I wonder, says, you know, will there be a day when you're looking at your kids and you basically can pinpoint the bad habits in your own life because you see them coming to fruition in your kid's life? You know, will there be a day where maybe harmless flirting can end you up in a relationship that can devastate even your own marriage? Because th those days are very real. And it's all because of the fact that sometimes our decisions, we want to do it our own way. And the whole time, the Holy Spirit is in our ear telling us, don't do that. Don't play with that. You're making a bad decision. Right? But will we be submissive and listen to the Holy Spirit and be obedient to the Holy Spirit, or are we just going to do it our own way? See, because I've seen way too much stuff, and I know that stuff is happening. And just because our community doesn't talk about it, we know that we have a ton of broken people suffering from horrible consequences, from horrible decisions. And all of this stuff, you think it breaks our heart? It breaks the heart of the Father to see the rebellious child suffer a consequence that was never intended for him. It breaks the heart of the Father who sent his Holy Spirit down to correct us along the way, to basically plead with us and to tell us, guys, don't do that. And the Holy Spirit's working and wrestling with hearts, saying you need to stay away from that. That's a bad decision. You do not want to see how that ends up. You know, because those decisions, the ones that we are ignoring the Holy Spirit in, those are the decisions that will determine what the rest of our life will look like. And if you want to ignore the Holy Spirit and follow the ways of the world or follow the path of society, that's what's in store for you. It doesn't end well. You know, because it's almost like we have these two school of thoughts, and we have to decide which one we're going to fall into. And it's simple. Do you want the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Or do you want the spirit of society around us and the fruit that that brings? You know, it always kills me because a lot of the times we, we see what society falls into all the time. All you need to do is turn on the news and you see what happens to the people who follow society's way, right? But we keep, you know, we keep choosing the wrong path again and again and again and again. And I love it because when Job was hurting, he lost everything and his wife told him, curse God and die. And if you had to be honest with yourself, don't you think that Job probably wanted to a little bit? At a point where he lost everything, the one thing that he did keep was his wife. And in this situation, <laughs> that worked against him. Because even his wife was telling him, like, dude, just give up. Like, it's not worth it. You know, Joseph went from being a spoiled kid to a land that didn't even know who God was. A total pagan land. Do you don't think that there's a part where Joseph wanted to shake his fist at God and say, what are you doing? You know, what about my dreams? What about, my, what about the promises that you made me? But they didn't. They didn't curse God. They didn't shake their fist at God. And you want to know why? Because they had already decided Right back when things were good, back before they had took a firm stance and they had already decided that, that they were going to follow God wholeheartedly, whether it was comfortable, whether it was uncomfortable, whether God was, you know, right there visible blessing them or whether they felt that God had completely and utterly abandoned them, that they had decided. And what I love about these two scenarios is these are Old Testament scenarios and we have so much more available to us with the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Because they had decided that they knew their God and nothing was going to sway them from that. So how do we get that? How do we get that? How do we give ourselves the ability to be completely submissive to the power of the Holy Spirit? And I'm just going to say three things. Okay, the first thing we have to do is we have to let go of our old ways. And I, we all know what they are. We have to let go of our old ways, the things that hinder us from God, our old thoughts, everything that we were valuing, everything that we were chasing that didn't align up to the pages of Scripture, right? Look at yourself right now and look at yourself deep. What are you chasing? What do you see inside of yourself that you know this does not line up to the gospel? 
you know, the second thing is we have to give up that our thought process is best. The way that we handle our own solutions, the way that when the Holy Spirit is trying to, to coach us or guide us in a certain way, and we tell the Holy Spirit, no, 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 I, I got this. We have to acknowledge that those are probably the biggest mistakes that we've made because it, it never works out well. Our old ways don't work. So we have to let go of all of that. The second thing, we need to change the way. Like, we need to change our own thought process. We have to kind of call it for what it is, that everything the society is telling us, it's wrong. You know, and if you look at the lifestyle that society is selling us, you know, the rich and the famous, they are the most miserable people out there. Right? That's where we see suicide, overdosing, divorce. You know, and it kills me because how many famous people do you know that has everything that, that life has to offer? How many of them are still married? You know, you look at sports, right? The two that always come to mind, you got Kobe and Tiger, right? These guys were on top of the world. They had everything, including extramarital affairs. That cost them everything. And I'll tell you even, so there's a lesson for the guys in that, and, but I'll tell you there's also a lesson for the girls in that, right? Because these wives would probably be considered to be some of the luckiest women in this world. They had everything. They had the rich, attractive husband. They had the form, I mean the fame, the fortune, everything that the world could offer them. And they had all of that. But what was the one thing they didn't have? A godly husband. A faithful husband. And at that point, they realized that none of that other stuff mattered. It didn't matter. So we need to fix, we need to fix our view on things, right? The only way we need to think is a way that lines up with our Bible. You know, you need to apply this book in our life as truth. And whatever we think that doesn't concide, that does not agree with this Bible, we've got to throw it out. Because God's ways are always perfect. His plans are not our plans. His ways are not our ways. But his are always superior. And we need to adhere to that. And the third thing is we need to decide that we want to be Christ-like. We want to be a disciple of our Father. We want to hear the Holy Spirit in our life. We want to have the Holy Spirit guide us and to be attentive to him. And what I love about this one is really, if you do one and two, the third one's gravy. It kind of happens on its own. You will see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And we just celebrate a Pentecost, receiving the Holy Spirit. So my thing is, in this week, let us listen for him. Let us seek him. Let us pursue him. Be in our Bible. And I promise you that as a good father, that when the son seeks him, that he will come out running, right? Even the story of the prodigal son, it wasn't even a good son. It was a prodigal son. It was a punk son who took advantage of the father, who ran off doing whatever he wanted to do. But because of the character of the father, when he saw the son approaching, he ran out and met him. And I believe that that would be the way that God will meet us this week if we pursue him, if we make our way home. And we have to understand that the choices that we make, the decisions that we are currently making is the most critical foundation right now. And the decisions and the choices are what's going to pave the rest of our life. Because we make our choices, but our choices make us. And I'll tell you, the last thing I kind of want to leave you guys with is the most important part of what happens here, like in the last, I don't know, maybe 30, 35 minutes that we just spent together, is really not meaningful at all. Right? Like we can, I could be up here for an hour, two hours, three hours. It really doesn't matter what happens when we're all in this setting. What really happens is when you take what we do in this setting and when you go home with it. And I challenge you guys that when we go home, do something with this. Do something with this information. Apply it somehow. That's the most important time of the week is a time that you spend alone in the presence of God trying to absorb whatever that God may have given you and how you apply it into your life. You can come here every Sunday, week in and week out, and never change at all. Actually, I'll be honest with you. If that's the plan, then we're probably going to be getting worse and worse and worse as every week uh, continues. But go home, evaluate your life. Think about compromises that you've made. Think about difficult situations that you've been in. 
you know, and where you've seen God show up. Maybe you can think about where God's tried to show up, but we've repressed him. And I'm going to ask you guys to talk about it with your spouse. Talk about it with your spouse. Talk about what you want your household to look like. One of my favorite verses, Joshua 24, 15, and it's probably way overquoted, is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I pray that we have a church that's full of houses that commit to that verse. And when we go home, think about those three steps I told you. Okay, the first one was like letting, letting go of your old ways, your old thoughts, everything that you thought was important, right? The second thing is we need to change the way that we think. We need to abandon the way that society's, uh, society's values and how they're telling us to live, and we need to adhere and submit to biblical values and what God tells us is important. And the third thing is, is we need to decide and make commitments to be Christ-like. And I believe that if we can do that, we will be floored by the way that God meets us in that. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you because you are a good God who's always pursuing us, Lord. You go out of your way to try to wrestle with hearts. So, Lord, I ask in this week, Lord, that I, I believe that we will pursue you. I believe that we will, that we will meet you in your word. I believe, Lord, that we want to be transformed. We want to renew our mind. For, Lord, there's nothing better than you. And I ask that you just allow us to stop taking the sucker's choice, Lord, and to, and, and to stop pursuing things that we think are going to bring us happiness, Lord, because we know that the true times that we have had happiness in our lives have been times where you have provided for us. So, Lord, I ask that we continue going back to your well to drink from it, Lord, because that's the same place where we always find satisfaction. Lord, I ask that you just let us confess, Lord, that Satan is a liar. And, and let us confess that we will not be deceived by him anymore. That these vain pursuits of stuff that doesn't matter, Lord, that we can kind of put that to bed and that we can pursue you and find you. So, Lord, I ask that this is the week, Lord, where we have meaningful time with you alone, in your presence, so that you can change us from the inside out. And I ask this through the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, the Atopio, St. Mary, Archangel Michael, St. John the Beloved, all the saints from our tears. Here's we pray thankfully, one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us